Episode 4 The End of the Road We continue as Warmaster Slado pushed onwards towards Balhut. In addition to those conflicts covered previously, dozens of fleet engagements, as well as major and minor planetary assaults, had taken place during Operation Newfound. The following are the most notable engagements and battles of this part of the Crusade. The First Battle of Severin The world of Severin is the main strategic objective of Operation Newfound and its conquest was essential to secure the territory that had been taken due to its location on the main and fastest stable warp route to Balhut as well as its links to the other worlds in the Newfound Trailings Group which Slado had marked for conquest during this phase of the Crusade. It was essentially a crossroads, but to a lesser extent than Balhut itself. However, it did offer the Crusade the best path to that crucial world. In addition to its strategic importance, it was located in the region known as the Reef Stars, which are notable for the holy visage of the saint the stars form from the right angle and distance, of course. This added additional spiritual significance to the more devout crusaders such as Slado himself, and it was along this route that St. Sabbath's original crusade had travelled. The First Battle of Severin, as it would become known, began on Candlemas 757, and initially routed the arch-enemy forces, and even slew the Chaos Commander Magister Cavulo. The mass Imperial Guard ground assault, led by Lord Militant Hummel and General Bulladin, was forced to dig in and break off the pursuit and eradication of the arch enemy forces. Due to extreme weather conditions setting in, at a suspiciously opportune moment for the Chaos worshippers, the enemy regrouped and counterattacked, retaking Nafar City. Colchis and Ramery. Bulladin pushed through the extreme snow and rain conditions, encircling and retaking Ramery. Hummel pushed towards Colchis, engaging in a six week air superiority war and retaking the city. Lord Militant Hummel would become known for his reliance in favour of air power as the Crusade progressed. The remaining arch enemy forces at Nafar City would bleed the Imperial forces over the course of eight weeks. 3,000 men died to take two kilometres of ground before the city's walls. Faced with failure to take the city and these extreme losses, Bulladin offered his resignation to the War Master. Slado refused and ordered him to do it again. Reinforced by a Warlord Titan, the Victress Impersonata, Bulladin's forces attacked again, finally overrunning the city's walls and defence, then stormed the Upper Palace, almost capturing the notorious Pata Bulka, the new Chaos Commander. He unfortunately died resisting capture. Fornex Aleph one of the strangest and most costly engagements for the Imperium occurred on the planet of Fornix Aleph. In 757, Imperial scouts reported that Fornix Aleph was an arch enemy world with moderately sized hives as well as a large defence fleet. Heavy fighting was expected to conquer the system. To that end, Slado directed a considerable fleet and guard army under one of his most promising protégés, General Jatta Elbeth. Elba fed nine regiments, including two full armour brigades and a full force of 300 Iron Snakes of Ithaca deployed to this attack. Unfortunately for the Imperials, massive but localised warp storms erupted en route, which delayed the date of the invasion of the system twice. The Iron Snakes fleet of battle barges were held becalmed and unable to enter the warp for four months, and the main naval and guard fleet was caught and scattered en route. When Elbereth finally translated in system, he had only a third of his strength, the rest of his force either being scattered to some neighbouring system or lost. 
Elbeth was now full and was seen as one of the Warmaster's rising stars with great prospects for future command. For that reason, he did not launch a foolhardy attack on Fornex Aleph and instead withdrew his forces to the system's edge to await the arrival of the rest of the invasion force or attempt to flee the system if the enemy seemed too powerful. As time passed and having received no challenge from the arch enemy forces reported on Fornex Alpha, Albrecht ordered the rapid pursuit frigate Ziegler to conduct an intruder pass into the system to gather intelligence on the enemy's strength and disposition. To the astonishment of Albrecht, the Ziegler reported that no resistance had been encountered from the planetary defences. The orbital yards were empty and that no enemy fleet had been detected. Additionally, its scans detected no electromagnetic activity on the planet. No Vox, no power, no sign of activity. The world looked abandoned and its cities were dark. The cruiser Claudio was dispatched to conduct a more detailed scan and returned with the same results. There was no one on the world. There were not any signs of industry, power or activity of any type. Even in the hinterlands outside the main hive cities and major settlements, the planet looked dead. After much consideration, Albert decided to lead a spearhead force to the surface, consisting of two regiments of ray-barked heavy infantry and the Vitrian 10th Armoured Brigade, 16,000 men and 800 fighting vehicles. The assault encountered no resistance as it encircled and then entered the main hive city of Kyosom. Kyosom, like every other city the Imperials investigated, was empty of people. Half-eaten meals were found in homes, and half-finished games of regicide were found in street parlours. Every single human being on the planet had simply disappeared. Elbeth's engineers restored power to the main cities, which had wound down from lack of supervision. Plague was ruled out, as there were no burial pits or signs of panic from mass contagion. They all seem to have simply just disappeared from the planet in an instant. Albert gathered his forces and fortified Karazhan. Reinforcements were expected soon, but from Albert's combat log, the foreboding and unnerving stillness of the deserted world began to eat at the moral of even the stoic Vitrians. At night, screams were heard throughout the hives, though no one was ever found. Albert reported to Slater regularly of what he described as the fearful absence we have uncovered. On the first day of 758, all transmission from Elvis Force ceased. The Iron Snakes finally broke free of the warp storms and arrived in orbit of Fornix Aleph eight days later. The full 300 Astartes launched drop pod assaults across the world. Even the sons of Ithaca were disturbed by the world, reporting back to Slado, Warmaster, my lord, there is no one here at all. It was not simply Elbeth's ground forces that had disappeared, the fleet had gone as well. The only evidence that could be found were two drop pods washed up on the coast, equipment and supplies stowed in the area the Imperial Guard should have been, and Elbeth's log, as well as some personal effects. And most oddly of all, on the roof of an eight-story hab block, a single Vitrian Lehman Rus Conqueror had somehow been deposited. All the crew were gone, the cords from their voxets having been fused from the last 30 centimetres of cord. And, still gripping the gearbox lever, a gauntlet containing the calcified hand of its owner. Three days later, the Iron Snake's fleet detected a ship entering fatal orbit around Fornax's sun. The ship was believed to be the Claudia, but this was not confirmed before the ship entered its fiery grave. Slado ordered the Iron Snakes to withdraw, lest such a massive and powerful force suffer the same fate as those before, and rob the Crusade of one of its strongest fighting forces and potentially damage its prospects. However, before they could withdraw, a large stellar object 
which had somehow been undetected, either a comet or a meteor, smashed into Fornex Alpha's polar regions, unleashing cataclysmic natural disasters across the world, such as volcanic eruptions, earthquakes and tsunamis, as well as the collapse of the northern ice shelf. The Iron Snakes were unable to leave the world in the short term, due to the damage in the atmosphere, hunkered down in defensive positions in the remaining hive cities and withstood the fallout from the meteor strike. But then, from the blasted north came forth a vast legion of demonic entities, surging forth and laying siege to the Iron Snakes positions in the hive cities. For nearly a year, this brutal war continued, with the Iron Snakes fighting back legions of demonic foes as they threw themselves at the walls of the Hive Cities. Even when the environmental damage from the Meteor Strike abated, the Iron Snakes fought on, but now with support from their battle barges in orbit. Eventually, the scattered elements of Elbeth's original invasion force finally began to enter the system and immediately deployed their guard forces to aid the Iron Snakes. But by then, the brave sons of Ithaca had vanquished the demonic foe utterly. The Force Commander, Brother Captain Cools, called it the long battle through the endless night, and it had cost them dearly, but Fornax Aleph had been cleansed and secured for the Imperium. The Iron Snakes had now secured the Imperial Crusade from defeat and dishonour on two occasions. The Imperium has been unable to give a full explanation for the disappearances on Fornax Alpha, nor the emergence of the demonic horde, other than to speculate that it must be connected to the warp storms which had erupted in the stellar locality, or some plot by the forces of the Arch Enemy to utilize arcane and twisted sorcery to attempt to fight the gallant crusaders of the Imperium. Whatever the reason, the recolonization of Fornax Alpha has been underway for the last 15 years, and the planet was deemed purged of corruption. No other instances of disappearance have occurred, but on some nights, screams can be heard ringing out across the hives to this very day. Astartes in the Sabbath Crusade As mentioned previously, the Iron Snakes have proven themselves essential and a supremely effective fighting formation during the Sabbath Crusade, and they will continue to do so throughout the Crusade. Aside from the vast forces of the Imperial Navy, Imperial Guard, and elements of the Mechanicum which had joined the Crusade, those contingents of the Adaptus Astartes who had sworn themselves to St. Sabbath's Liberation Crusade and Warmaster Slado were a massive force multiplier to the advance. On numerous occasions, they would rescue Imperial forces from defeat by a foe which was well trained, highly motivated and surprisingly numerous, as well as equipped with weaponry which was often the match for those fielded by the Imperium. The presence on the Imperial side of large forces of Astartes such as the White Scars, Silver Guard, who would suffer many casualties on Balhut soon and were led there by their chapter master himself, and the 300 brothers of the Iron Snakes of Ithaca amongst other chapters, offered the Imperium a solid advantage in its advance, as wherever they were deployed, the Arch Enemy could not hope to resist them. The Chaos Forces appear to have had very few traitor Space Marines within their armies. In fact, on the few occasions they were encountered during the Crusade, they only numbered in the dozens, and on one occasion, Imperial Forces discovered the destroyed wreck of a Chaos Space Marine Dreadnought as well as on Balhut, where several dreadnoughts were reported. Other than that, only individual Chaos Space Marines were ever encountered, and these were acting as field commanders or champions, although these individuals could wreak havoc and savage violence on Imperial forces. They could not hope to hold off the vast assault waves of men and armour Slado would deploy when invading worlds, let alone the company strength contingents of the Emperor's Angels which would often act as the tip of the spear and attack the most heavily defended enemy positions. On one notable raid, deep into arch enemy held space, several space marines from different chapters were assigned to assist the strike team of elite imperial guardsmen in fulfilling their mission. 
This discrepancy in Astartes numbers would continue through the Crusade and would always give the Imperium the advantage wherever the Astartes fought. As to why so few of the traitor legions were present in the enemy ranks, it probably is to do with the relative isolation of the Sabbat worlds from any of the larger warp anomalies which act as refuges, bases and fortresses to the corrupted and the thrice cursed traitors. Kosaminu, the world that refused to die. According to Imperial estimates, the taking of the troubled world of Kosaminu has cost the lives of around 8 million guardsmen from 760 to 773. The initial conquest of the world was conducted by Slato's second front force, whose role was to swoop in on enemy worlds which had been bypassed by the main crusade force and could offer alternative approaches to Balhut. General Kelso, a tankman, directed armoured assaults on the world's hive cities, capturing three of them in quick succession. The legendary Narminian I were deployed under the command of the then Colonel Grismond, who would later rise to the rank of general and play a major part during the Siege of Vervenhive, and will be mentioned again. It was in this campaign that Grismond began his rise to greatness, fighting two major tank battles around the city of Harsheng and its surrounding dune seas. It took two years to finally conquer the world, and the most high-profile casualty amongst Imperial command occurred. When Lord Militant Vikras, an extremely popular commander amongst the guard ranks, was ambushed and killed during the notorious Sabre Bridge incident, when Vickers' armoured convoy was provided with bad intelligence that his route was clear of enemy forces, but ran right into the foe. Cosimenius would be fought over three more times, when, after Belhut fell, fleeing arch enemy forces managed to retake the world, and the Crusade had to dispatch forces from the front to resecure it. The Second Battle of Severin The tough fighting that had stalled Operation Newfound was made worse by the outbreak of plague and famine on a number of worlds in the Crusade's rear. Formal Prime, now acting as a logistical now acting as a logistical supply hub for the advance, suffered outbreaks of Rosepock distemper, which delayed their movement of men and material to the front line. Famine and drought also affected a number of worlds, possibly due to the activities of remnant archenemy forces, limiting the flow of supplies and foodstuffs. But the Crusade had fought on, but the Crusade had fought on, and had achieved almost all of the objectives Slado had marked and a strike on Balhut was now possible. It was at this moment that the arch-enemy forces under the command of Archon Nadzibar himself finally launched their counter-attack, which smashed into the Crusaders' front line, invading multiple worlds and placing a large piece of recently conquered territory at risk. Severin was invaded and overrun by Chaos worshippers, and General Bulladin and the forces under his command were rushed to the world, tasked with its defence. At least until Slado could gather the forces necessary to push the arch enemy back. Bulladin's orders were to deny the enemy the world as a springboard to a deeper thrust into the newfound trailing group. And to that end, to hold the key fuel and supply depots which had been established on the world. Bulladin knew the world well and wrote, this place will not belabour me twice. The Imperial forces on Severin immediately counterattacked the enemy, Bulladin being unwilling to be bottled up in defensive positions and slowly annihilated. This confidence boosted the morale amongst the defenders and allowed them to at first stall and then begin to push back the numerically superior enemy forces. By 761, after nearly a year of fierce fighting across the planet, reinforcements began to arrive, and Imperial Command determined that Bulladin's forces had not only been battling the war hosts of Magistar Sholon Shkara with his vile Kith brethren, but also the armies of Archon Nadzibar himself. The arch enemy forces on the surface were pushed back into several jungle walled cities in the southern continent, 
and after 16 months of war and siege, they finally broke, and those that could fled Severin. The Archon and Magister Skara began to withdraw their armies back to arch enemy territory, with Imperial forces in hot pursuit. The battle had been described by Imperial analysts and historians as the tipping point of the Crusade. If Severin had fallen, the arch enemy would have had the lightly defended centre of the Crusade's territory open before them, and could have broken Slado's armies in two, and made them ripe for annihilation, as well as potentially seeing the entire reconquest of the Sabbat worlds reversed and the region once more under chaos domination. It is no understatement that Bulladin's efforts saved the Crusade from destruction and enabled the future victories to come as he blunted the elite of the enemy's strength and inflicted massive casualties. At the time, the full size of the arch enemy armies invading Severin was unknown, as was the presence of the Archon and his personal war hosts. If Bulladin had been aware of the foe he faced and the odds against him, he may have been more cautious in the defence, instead of boldly driving at the foe. But for all the hardships the balance of power had, for the time being, at least shifted into the Imperium's favour, and Slado would take full advantage. After the Archon's counter-attack had been thwarted, with much cost the Crusade's front line was stabilised, and Imperial High Command began to discuss the current strategic situation, and whether the change of direction was called for in the face of the resistance and losses already sustained. Kaiborn and Revere voiced concerns over the tactics and direction of the Crusade and believed a drive straight at Balhut, Slado's intention from the beginning, would be costly and that alternative options could win the war. Slado, however, would not be swayed from Balhut. It was tactically essential to push deeper into the Sabbat worlds and would also allow for and secure the defence of all the worlds connected to it via its stable warp routes, which congregated at the Balhut system as if it were a stellar crossroads. Not only this, spiritually, Slado was committed to retracing the steps of Saint Sabbath's original crusade, and treated with great respect the opinions of her main advisor, Fulternius, whom believed Balhut was the most important world in determining who controls the Sabbath cluster. So no matter the strategic merits of alternative routes of advance, Slado believed, as he always had, it has always been Balhut, it will always be Balhut. These worlds turn upon its axis. The Fabian Ruse In 764, the Archon's retreat from Imperial territory was complete and he began to rally fresh war hosts and armies from his Magistars deeper within the Sabbat worlds, as well as various vassal warlords to create an unstoppable army to unleash against the Crusade in a single knockout blow. This pursuit of a single all-out major decisive engagement was Slado's desire as well. To that end, an intelligence operation began whereby Slado would attempt to corral the enemy into a massive confrontation, but this confrontation would occur on Balhut, his original goal, ensuring that the enemy would be smashed apart and the vital world would be in Imperial hands. The Archon attempted to draw the Imperials to the world of Fabia, where he would halt and destroy them. Slado allowed him to believe this and ordered fleet movements and troop deployments into that area of space to create the impression of a massive build-up of strength and that the Crusader forces were preparing to strike at Fabia. Also, as with any conflict, particularly on this scale, there are always going to be spies, and the Arch Enemy had spies operating within the Imperial War Machine. Slado saw to it that his operatives planted information on troop dispositions as well as requisition orders, which when they reached the ears of the Archon would prove that the Imperium is taking the bait, and create the impression that the Archon had more time than he did to organise his own plans. In addition to these secretive moves, Slado began to publicly support 
the alternative plans of Lord Militant Kyborn to launch a ringward attack on the arch enemy rather than drive for Balhut, saying that it was a viable option if we closed at Fabia, which of course leaked immediately across the Imperial communication network and reached the Archon's ears, further supporting the evidence the arch enemy had been receiving. Archon Nadzubar, confident that he would have a mass engagement at Fabia, and believing he still had the time to strengthen its defences and gather more legions of the damned to his banner, moved his vast army to Balhut, controlled by his loyal magister, Sholan Skara, to rearm and resupply his now vast host, in preparation for the decisive battle to come. And so, without knowing he had been deceived, his vast army and fleet were caught completely by surprise when the combined battle fleet of the Sabbath Crusade tore from the warp and began its mass assault of the Balhut system. Slado wanted Balhut, he wanted to destroy the enemy war host, and he wanted Nadzibar's head. And though he would achieve all these things, the cost would be great. In the next episode, Slado's long dream for invasion of Balhut begins, and the Crusade will suffer for this dream. Thanks for watching, and please remember to subscribe, like, and share if you can. Also, please follow the links to my stalking channels uh, if you want to see what I'm up to next, and please remember to check out my other videos and let me know what you think. See you next time. Cheers.